grower. Yeah, I'm not going to go through it, but here's the letter. We replaced every lamb that he didn't get on his contract. The buyer did not. It is indeed refreshing to do business with an organization such as NFO who recognizes the importance of contractual agreements and their implementation. We hope our performance has been acceptable and we may continue a lasting business relationship with NFO. This year I sold that man another set of lambs. It turned out $6 a hundred head high and he took every one of them. My bankruptcy situation, I had a buyer default was the first one. My, my buy bankruptcy was where we had in Coast Pack in Oregon. We had to over $250,000 in that, in that place. And what happened is the fact that the, the place closed and here we are with the money. A letter from the state of Washington. Most of you have seen this. We would appreciate being advised just how this system operates. As you know, we probably give more protection to producers than any other state, but your protection to sellers of livestock far exceeds ours or any other agency we know. This is from the Secretary of uh, Agriculture in the state of Washington. So I'm going to say one thing. Young, all the little scare stories you can hear from your neighbors and stuff, Dick Hammond can stand up here, and I've been with NFO since 1975, and they have not let me down in any one of these cases. Not once. We'll program on one brother. It's nuts and bolts for us. <coughs> Remember this. When you're talking to your neighbors, this is not my program. This is a self-help program for you. Self-help. Now, that is the difference that you've got. Your buyer is going to provide a service to you and you're going to pay for it. How much? I don't know. That's up to the discretion of the buyer or the conditions that dictate it. But this program here, keep in mind, folks, is a self-help program. I work for you. My allegiance is to you. My direction comes from you. you know, winners are, peop are those people who are capable of utilizing their own intelligence and skills in cooperation with others of the same mind to attain the goals they, them they themselves have set. Key factors. That's it right there. There's the key factors. Man, I can tell you. Why? Why is, why is this so good for you? Man, you can control your breeding. You know what kind of sheep and cattle you're going to buy. Health. Man, you'll be out there with your vaccines. You've got a whole sheet, Gary. You've got a whole sheet that tells you how much you've done to that animal. You've got maximum, get all the lamb crop, sheep crop you can get. Maximum utilization of feed. Man, I'll let somebody get on my feed on a mountain, and man, we've got a range war. But when it comes to marketing, yeah, I've talked to the president of the Colorado Wool Grocers, and I says, why do we always have veterinarians? We're sick in the wrong spot. He says, Dick, marketing is very frustrating, and then he says, it's very unproductive. Besides, we don't know anything about it, and we want to leave it alone. That was the honest answer. Production. That is where your efforts and priorities lie because that's what you do best. That's exactly what you do best. That's what the colleges have trained you to do best. Thrifty sheep, maximum lamb crop because good feed conditions, maximum market pounds of lamb. What's missing again? Your price. How much time? And this is again not, I speak more past you because you're the representatives. You're the people who are going to be talking to the people. I won't touch anybody past this minute. But if, I, if every one of you talk to 10, just think how many people we've touched. How much actual time and money do you spend on marketing in comparison with the other four factors? How much time do you spend? Look at that. How much do you spend on that centerpiece? Why don't you spend money? It isn't that you don't want to make that. You don't spend money on that because you have the least control. You can control quality, you control pounds, you can control health, you can do all of those things, but you do not have any control when it comes to the marketplace. No control. That's why you avoid it. You, that's why you spend the least amount of money. Why should I spend money on something I can't do anything about? That's general attitude. Go all the way through your whole agricultural system. They can tell you all about it, but you don't have any control in the marketplace. Now. This is what you do, the final key factor, marketing. This is where you separate, as far as my program is, the men from the sheep. And that's speaking as a buyer. Right here, marketing, control. If your answer, if you have no control, if you don't feel you've got control, 
then you've got to, you've got to make this change before you, before you lose all the rest of the factors can't keep up with it. We proved it time and time again. Simple formula. Collective volume of lambs combined with a vital market information and professional bargaining equals control, which in turn equals cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Only after you've completed the final key factors will your sheep operation be totally in your control. It is an absolute law. No segment of the economy can survive when the buyer prices the product and the services. Why can't we accept that? Why do we say, why do we say we're different? Talk to your neighbors. They'll tell you they're different. They're independent. They don't need any help. The bottom line is a system designed to do something for you instead of a system designed to do something to you. And when you can get those two prepositions turned around, you've made a lot of steps in your community. That's my presentation. I mean, that's just as far as I can bring this thing. This is far. It why. When you sit down and you talk to your neighbors, you ask them, why? And why not? Why should we do this? Why should we get collectively together? Why should we try to get control of our product? Ask those questions. They're good, honest questions. And why not? Why, why not have it? Ask them. You'll learn, and they'll learn. But this business, you've got to discuss this on a rational basis, business-wise basis. Why is it wrong for you to try to control your price and try to control your product? Why is it wrong? There may be some people in the United States think that's absolutely wrong. The decision you've got to make is you want to put a dollar up for my program, or whatever it takes for Gary's, or we just want to sit there and do nothing. Now, after you've heard this, I've got this in any time. Anybody wants a copy of this, we can get one out. And you take this to your banker and you discuss it with him and let him poke holes through it if there's a hole in there to be found. I want to know about it. I'm not perfect, and I know damn well I'm not. I'm going to tell you one thing. This is Dick Hammond 20 years ago. Do you see that? I went from where I had 6% of the receipts on the Omaha livestock market to the largest, and when I left, we had 42%. I've done this. I put it together, and there wasn't anything in Omaha, Nebraska. I was in Omaha, Nebraska, and there wasn't anything in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Chicago, Denver, Kansas City, St. Louis, and St. Joe that sold, including Wichita, sold without finding out what Dick Hammond did first. That wasn't because Dick Hammond was so damn smart. It was because Dick Hammond had the volume and he knew how to use it. And you say, right away, I can see the look on your face. What in the hell, if he did all of this, what in the hell is he doing here if he had this in the palm of his hand? Right? <laughs> OK. Now, the answer to that is that I did such a good job, the Packers paid me enough money to get out of there. You, as growers, made me. Dick Hammond is a nothing without volume. Dick Hammond is something with volume, or any other person in my boots, Gary. Dick Hammond had you people shipping lambs to him. They'd call me on the phone. The market was saggy. I'd say, hey, hold off a day or two. Play it cool, OK? I orchestrated. I was the director of the music, little music over here, little music over there, and we made music. We didn't have a horn and a trombone and a big zoo blasting off on their own. We made music. Now, the packer is sitting there, and he's in trouble. What does he do? I'll tell you what he does. He gets on the phone, and he calls that man that made me and said, hey, you know it will take a dollar to come to Omaha. We'll buy your lambs, F-O-B, your place at, let's say the market's 25, we'll give you 24, and you know what the price is. The guy, no, no, I can get 25 in Omaha. The guy says, yeah, but it takes a dollar. Yeah, but I don't know. Okay, we'll, finally what'll happen? He says, well, I'll let you know. So he calls me up and says, what's the market in Omaha? I says, 25 cents. He says, how's it going to be for tomorrow? So, well, it looks like major, I'm being honest, steady. 
Okay, fine. Hangs up the phone, does the same thing they did in California with somebody else paying the bill, calls up the buyer and says, I'll take 25. Buyer says, no, I won't get, but I'll give 24 and a half. Great. He saved, made 50 cents, didn't he? Buyer saved 50 cents. Everybody's happy, right? Simple formula, no problem. The only problem is those buyers only picked the good lambs that were the high yielders. So let's take it a little farther on down the road and in six, seven months or a year, it takes a little while, just like it does for you to grow a crop, it takes a little time for these things to turn around. Six months or a year from now, all I've got on the Omaha terminal market is crap, low yielding lambs. Now I'm establishing a $22 market with crap and you're now selling your lambs in the country at 21 and a half and making a big fat deal. Damn, boy, we're smart. But it's easy. It's called, you know, that's the way the game's played. So if you want to get in the game with professionals, if you're qualified, do so. But I'll tell you one thing. You're in a tough ball game with professional people. <coughs> Raising people are doing it in California. They got the market sewed up in California. That's already being done. And the only thing I can look you in the face and really say, I'm very happy and very privileged to be a representative of one of the major farm organizations in the United States, the only collective one, collective bargaining one. I also get an opportunity to, do, to be with people that are recognized, as Devon said last night, the envy of the world. We are the greatest producers in the history of mankind. The only sad thing about that is we cannot produce an economic environment that allows our young to survive. Thank you. And now here's Gary Ellis, director of the feeder cattle division. Try to sell a dead one, that's even harder. Uh, you can really run into some problems when you get up that far into the industry and attempt to move your own meat uh, because you're right up against the boys uh, that everybody's trying to fight now and it's a pretty tough situation to handle. Uh, he said something else that brought something else to my mind. I don't know how many of you were at uh, the seminars that were held in the summer, but I feel our programs that we run are very similar in a way to an old instrument that I'm sure most all of you have used and that's a hammer. If you go to drive a nail with a hammer and the nail bends, you don't throw the hammer away. They put claws on that hammer to pull it out and to start over again. And that's what we've done, I'm sure, several times in the organization and it's something that we may have to do again a time or two. If a program we start doesn't work right, then we are situated to the point where we can back up and start it over again. Uh, it's just that simple in my feelings. Uh, would you mind switching my little button on on the back of my machine there? I forgot to do that before I come up. Uh, what I want to go into today, I want to go in to the complete beginning of a feeder cattle program, tell you how, where to start to physically move your cattle through the organization. We're going to go through two or three ways to go about it. This seems to me that in most of the areas, probably the problem we've got is we're not getting it across to an individual how to move his production through the organization. I have people call me in the office and ask me how do I go about getting my cattle through the organization. Uh, most areas were pretty well set up with collection points, with commission or full-time staff people to where in my opinion it's a little asinine that guys be, have to call into the office and ask me. So I've decided at this convention that I'm going to start at ground zero and work up through the program and explain to people how to move their cattle through the organization so that you in turn may go home and explain to the producers in your area or anybody that might ask you how to move their cattle through the organization. 
So what I want to start off with first here would be the benefits of selling feeder cattle through the organization and how we go about it. You may call your feeder blockers in your area. That would or could be a reason that you might need to initiate a call uh, to the office if you don't know who to talk to in your area. I hate to think that in any area where there is a lot of feeder cattle that anybody wouldn't know who to talk to, but I'm sure that could be a possibility. Uh, we do say that we will have the proper weighing conditions on your cattle, fair weighing conditions on your cattle. There is one thing that we ask for when cattle are moved direct or cattle are moved through a way up or cattle are moved on contract, that the weighing condition on the end of the seller also be fair. There are times and areas where there has to be a certain percentage shrink factor put on cattle in order to move them. However, on the calf contracts and on a lot of the yearling cattle that we sell direct, the only thing we ask is that the weighing conditions be right. I'll tell you now, if cattle need shrinking, they will be shrunk. If they don't need shrinking, they will not be shrunk. If they're so filled that we can't tell how much we need to be shrunk, we'll send them home. Now we're right back to what Dick was talking about a while ago. If we're going to have a program, it's got to work on both ends. If we expect the top dollar, then we've got to have the top kind of production to bring those dollars. So the only thing we say as far as weighing conditions is they will be right. Then we go to guaranteed payments. I think Dick pretty well covered that uh, in what he was saying, several situations that he's been into and how they were handled. Um, so I won't go into anything on guaranteed payments. Fair grading. I, don't, I guess nobody or no two of us in this room would probably eyeball a set of cattle exactly alike. But I think the way we're set up we try to use the same people within the same points. We've had some problems in the past. We're putting on new people. We've put on four new people in the feeder division in the last two months to be out here and help you work the grading situations. We don't like to have the buyer grade the cattle, but we certainly need the right kind of graders working for us so that we can satisfy the buyers on the other end whenever we grade and move the cattle. Set your own floor price. This is going into our contracting. Our contracts that made as of last year do have a place on there for you to put in the floor price that you will not sell for less than that figure, the cattle or whatever you have on the contract. That has been, I think, a big advantage as far as getting people to put production on the contract because if we cannot get the price you have on the contract, you are free to do whatever you want to with the cattle. You can call for your contract back at any time that it's unsold and we'll mail it back to you. I would appreciate it when we get these contracts with the floor price on them, however, if you would date them as to a deadline you wish to have the cattle sold, rather than send them in with a floor price on them as of this year of $1.10, and then a week later uh, call in and want your contract back because you've decided it's never going to get to that or something. Uh, so if you would give us a little bit of time to work on the thing and date them. Now we have done something uh, this year that we haven't maybe had to do for quite a while because we did have this floor pricing formulation because we did have a lot of people with cattle signed up from a dollar to a dollar and a quarter. When that situation arises, we will get back to the people in the area where the cattle are contracted on a regular basis, if that's possible, and let you know at the time what we can get for the cattle at that time. And of course, what 
the men, the blockers, or the collection point representatives, whatever your instance might be, need to do is get back to the people who have cattle signed up in his area then and just have a regular, regular ratification type meeting on whether they want to go on the price that is available or not. That's one thing I do have against the floor pricing formulation that we have on these contracts is the fact that so many people will come out and say, well, I'd just as well go ahead and put them down at a buck and a quarter, and if you can't get it, we can always drop it. This is true, but you run into a lot of instances in a year like this and a year like 1973 where you can't drop it fast enough to get caught up. Because if you've got a contract out here with 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 head of feeder cattle on it, and there happens to be 20 different producers represented on that contract, and you've got to get a hold of each and every one of them before you can get back to me and say it's okay, and Joe's gone on vacation, and John's out working in the field and only comes in at 11 o'clock at night, and you're already in bed, and he got out before you got up the next morning, so it takes us a week to catch them all, and by the time everybody's agreed, it's gone. Because on a down market situation, the buyers aren't going to hang in there for a week period waiting for us to decide whether we're going to go at the price or not. So that has created some problem on the floor pricing contract. However, again, I say the floor pricing contract has increased our ability to get in a block of cattle because a guy is not physically tied down and not knowing what he might get out of his production when it's sold. Our nationwide structure for collective bargaining, I think you're all aware of that. Dick went into that somewhat too. We are nationwide. There's times when there is a big demand in the central south and the western, southwestern areas for the southeastern cattle. There is a time when there's a big demand in the Midwest for the western cattle. There's a time when there's a big demand in the Midwest for the southern cattle. So we do have the ability to move cattle out of any given area into another area wherever the prices are being paid the best at the time, providing it's the time of year you can move cattle to a particular area. So we do have a nationwide structure for collective bargaining. You have your opportunity to forward contract, which we were talking about there a minute ago, and you have transit loss coverage on your production while it is being moved to the collection point. In the event you go direct to a farmer feeder or this type of a buyer, you have coverage from the time the cattle are loaded at your place to the other end. For any of you who might have any questions in your mind, I've had this one hit me a time or two. We do not cover production with transit loss as it's being loaded up a producer's chute. We cannot physically be responsible for going out and tacking up everybody's chute and making sure the floor in it is okay. It's from the time your production is on the truck and that end gate is closed until they're unloaded at the collection point if you're going through a point or until they're unloaded at the buyer's place if they're going directly to a buyer. It doesn't cover the cattle in your lot when you get them in to run them, and it doesn't cover the cattle as they're going up your chute and your loading facilities. It covers them after they are on the truck. I've had this question arise, yes? Is that, if that's on my truck? Yes. Do I right. If you're, if you're going through the organization and taking the NFO checkoff, on any of your production, then you're covered. That's included in the $1.29 in the Midwest and Eastern areas and the $1.44 in the Western areas, or the maximum of $8 a hundred after you get up about 519 pounds, I think, in the Midwest area at your $1.29. Yes? Yes, right, right. As long as the deductions are taken on the livestock and mailed in as they're supposed to be or called in as they're supposed to be, you are covered.
Okay, I want to go in a little bit here to there what? Here. Yes. Yes, they are. You'd need to talk to the Fat Cattle Division on that. I can't answer the question on it. Uh, but yes, there is a transit insurance on cull cows. Uh, the reason I really want to get into this thing in a little bit more, I guess, here on this transit insurance, you see, it's your program. You have so much per hundred or so much per head pulled out on everything you ship. And all you've got to do is abuse it or misuse it a little bit, and I can guarantee you your rate's going to go up. And it's, everybody's going to be paying for it, so it's all of us. It's our job to see that people out here don't abuse the thing. If you get a cow into the point that you're not sure it's going to live even till you get it on the truck, I'd mark it off of the insurance deal and not even, not even let them insure it because you're asking for trouble. Our insurance that you're all paying when you ship production is not for some guy to bring something in there that he's afraid is going to die before he can get it to town anyway. So if it does, he can get a full check out of it off of the insurance program. Because you're all fooling yourselves. You're all paying for it whenever that happens. Uh, it's coming out of all of you's pocket, and you're all going to pay for it in the long run because every time it happens, it's going to bring the insurance rates up a little bit more. I put this on here for one reason. I've got some brochures here that any or all of you is welcome to take some, whatever you want, home with you when you go. I think I've got plenty with me to pass out. This shows where NFO really started getting into the feeder cattle program and what it does and what happens when we don't do anything. You can call it coincidence if you want to. It's not. And what you do is what the majority of everyone else does. When things are at the best, there's nothing to worry about. So it's not only you, it's everybody, but we can, there's enough of us that we can change it. But whenever we decide to physically block and move cattle, on forward contracts in advance, we can raise the market. Whenever we decide that everything's okay and we don't need anyone else's help like we did in 1973 because who'd want any more? We had cost of production plus a profit plus, and we didn't need anybody's help. It was going to stay there forever. So you see where you finally end up when that happens. We're in an awful close situation right now to 1973 and 74. I'm not sure it's not worse because we don't have to go down as far to be in the same kind of shape we were in 73 and 74 because of the increase in costs of everything else that we're purchasing today. But still, we got ourselves in the same position. We contracted some calves last year, and we got 90, and we got a 95, and we got a dollar, and we got a dollar five. So this year we wanted a dollar and a quarter. Well, I don't blame us. A dollar and a quarter wouldn't be bad with the way everything else has gone. But you've got to keep one thing in mind. You've got to have the volume, and you've got to have the ability to perform in order to be able to get whatever you ask. We've got a few things that's facing us that's maybe a little bit uncontrollable in the way of Shorter grain supplies, higher interest, bad economic outlook all over. But we could have held this market at that 95 and a dollar range if people would have been willing to contract for those type of figures. And I, like Dick Hammond again, would say I would rather have the 90 and be a nickel below somebody else or two or three cents than I would the 80 or the 75 that you might be getting today, but still be maybe a penny over what you could get somewhere else. So we started in after 1973. We finally got a little bit of a program put back together again. We finally got some people interested. 
and we started building the program back. Until we come to a point again in 1980 where we pretty well had it by the tail again and we didn't need any help again. And we didn't need to contract unless we could get a dime more than was really available to us. And so we've let it slip away again. That's probably not even completely down to where the market might be today. But we're on the downhill slide again. And we've all got to go home and see what we can do about it. Uh, it's a tough situation. I've had calls this year, just as we did in 1973, from groups here, there, and yonder that we hadn't heard from since 1973 who suddenly decided they'd like to try the program again. They heard how good we'd done last year. They didn't mention to me that they knew the market was falling all to pieces and they couldn't find anywhere else to go. They simply would say to me that we heard you had a real good program last year and we'd like to kind of get involved in that this fall if we could. So they're there and they're willing to get on the wagon and ride again. It's tough for us when we've come through last year and this spring with everybody holding back to go out here and tell anybody now you need to jump right on uh, and take all of these cattle from me, which I couldn't get for you last fall or this spring because the guys didn't want to go. They had their own way to go then, and now they're in trouble, so we need your help, and we need to sell you about four times as many cattle as we did last year. So it's a situation where you need to get with the program and you need to stick with the program. I'll guarantee you if we'd have locked in in 73 and 4, or we, if we would have locked in in 79 in the spring of 80, that nobody ever went broke making a profit. And it's just that simple, that's what we're faced with. You can have it good one year and for three years they'll take it away from you. But that doesn't do you any good. You just get deeper in the hole. You've got, it's got to be a yearly basis. We need to contract yearling cattle for spring delivery before the fall calves are even delivered. You need to have next fall's cattle down for contract right now. It doesn't matter whether they're born or not. We're going to get into the contract next. And we've got provisions in the buyer's contracts that by the 30th day of June or July next summer, we can give them exact figures right to the T of what we'll have if they're willing to buy the block of calves right now as we are forecasting it will be. And we've got a built-in situation in there in case of winter death loss that the numbers need to change. In case the bank closes you out and you're not going to have your cattle available anymore, or whatever the situation might be, we've got those clauses built in. So there's no problem with contracting them now, even though the calves aren't even born yet. There's a feeder contract for sale. As I was saying, here's your floor pricing formulation where it can be filled out. These cattle will not be sold for less than blank on choice steers weighing blank. You fill in your own weights, you fill in your own prices. Probably the most important thing as far as I'm concerned on that contract would be section one where it says immediate sale and future delivery, the description of the cattle. That is undoubtedly where we run into our biggest problem. There's no advantage to try to put something down that you think people would like. Anything is saleable to somebody. But when you sell something to somebody and that's not what it turns out to be when it's all said and done, you've automatically in nothing but trouble. So that's the most important line on there under the class of yearlings or calves 
I definitely need to know that. Under sex, you definitely need a breakdown of how many steers and how many heifers you've got. Under breed, we've sold a lot of cattle this year direct to other farmer feeders, other NFO members. They call in and ask for a set of black baldy steer cattle, a set of straight black steer cattle, a, straight, a, a set of straight Hereford heifers, a set of exotic cross steers. If all I've got on your contract is mixed, I've got problems because I've either got to get a hold of the feeder blocker or I've got to get a hold of you. And I don't know whether you know how many of these contracts come through this office or not, but it's phenomenal. And there's no way we can physically get on the phone and call everybody back who's got a contract and say, now, what have you got? So it is important, I think, when we print our next bunch of contracts, I may squeeze together that weighing conditions or that floor price formulation, and I may make two whole lines in there for description of cattle. I know what we've got there now isn't big enough for what you really need. But do the best you can on it in putting in the breed. Uh, the grade thing, do the best you can. I suppose it's really not that important. If we've got the breed in there, I think we can pretty well handle it from there. Uh, if you're talking strings of cattle or you're in an area where we can get a rep out to look at the cattle, uh, we'll probably be able to kind of take care of the grading in. Estimated weight at delivery, about the only thing you can do, again, of course, is go back to your last year's figures, what your calves done. That, again, when you get into that July and August period, your feeder blocker in your area or your feeder rep should be keeping me informed, or I would probably already be pretty well aware of what your weather conditions would be like and whether you should maybe physically be running into heavier calves or lighter calves than you produced the year before. But all these things are important. You know, if you go in to a GM dealer to buy a new Cadillac and all he's got is a bunch of used Chevys, he's not going to sell you, is he? And we're in the same situation. There's no reason with the amount of collection points, with the amount of staff, with the amount of commissioned people that work for this organization that I can't get a call this morning from a man who says, I want a pot load of black and black baldy steers weighing 500 pounds. There's no reason why I couldn't initiate 12 phone calls to my feeder specialist and they can't initiate the phone calls out to the blockers in their area and in a half a day we can't have that load of steers for that man. It's all down to inventory and if you guys will use an inventory and if you guys will use these contracts we can have that. And I'll guarantee you there's no time that you can get the kind of money as when the guy is calling asking for a particular type thing. If you've got it, that's the top of the market right there. If you don't have it, he'll get it somewhere else. And the only thing we can physically do in the office, if you don't have that breakdown, if you don't have it out of your area, I'm not going to have it in the office, I'll guarantee you. So if you've got people that's got a product to sell, for heaven's sakes, get an inventory of it and either keep it on hand yourself. It's not necessary to keep that in to me all the time. As I say, we can initiate the calls out of here to the field men and they should have a running inventory with them. It's the only way your program is ever going to work right is to know what you've got on hand all the time, what you've got to be sold. I'm going to go on from that again. I say if you're talking 400 pound calves, then let's fill it out as such. 
it's very, very important the description of the animals that we have on there are broken down to where we can tell exactly what we've got to sell. If we say we've got some 500 pound calves for sale, then that's what I need 500 pound calves. I don't need a 1,200 or 2,200 pound buffalo cross thing. However, if I know you've got it, we can probably sell it. I think I need maybe tuned in there just a little bit. Can you right up there on the front? I don't know why that didn't focus in. Knowing what you've got on your place, whether it be crossbred calves or whether it be straight-bred calves, steers or heifers, regardless of what they are, we do get calls for different things from different people. There's a market for anything out here that walks. And if we know what it is, and I can't put too much emphasis on this, this is the important thing. If we know what it is, we can move it. If we don't know what it is, we don't have a chance. And we need enough time available as far ahead as you can put it down and any place near the time you might want to move it. I'd rather waste a call to you and say, hey, I've got a guy that would take calves like you're talking about, do you want to go with them now? If you don't right then, fine. At least we know what you've got, and at least we made a try on it. If we don't know what you've got, we're completely out of luck. I want to go through the buyer's contract a little bit with you. It's very similar to the seller's contract as far as a specified number of head weight range, sex, quality range, breed. The buyer purchases under terms of this contract blank number of head of merchantable feeder cattle. Delivery date will be from, and then there's a place in there to put your delivery date. There's a weight range on these contracts. It's tough, again, I'd say, to sell at any time a particular individual feeder cattle from three to 800 pounds. That, again, is the reason that you need that inventory so bad. You can always break them down if you have to. This has been the first year that I'm aware of since I've been with the organization that we've had to do this, but we physically took two, three, four thousand head contracts this year, broke them down, sold them, load or two loads or three loads of cattle at a time, still brought them in all at the same time for delivery, but that's the way they were sold. We've done this to a lot of big blocks of cattle this fall, and if you have to, well, you have to. And unless you've got a breakdown on them, there's no other way you can do it. Again, on the buyer's contract, we usually try to build in a percent more or less, two, three, five percent more or less than the number we have on the contract, again, to kind of cover yourself in case of some death loss in the cattle or health problems in the cattle. Then the pricing structure is broke down on the buyer's sheet in 10-pound weight breaks and the price on the steers and the 10-pound weight breaks and the price on your heifers, exactly as they will be sold. FOB, the collection point. Then their payment is made by check, cash, However, at the end of the delivery day, prices for quality will be based on standards consistent with normal grading standards used today, grades to be, and there again depends on how the cattle have been quoted to us, how we sell them. If we're called in a block of 2,000 head of cattle and the guy tells me, hey, every one of them is 
high choice as it can be, then I'm going to sell a choice calf contract. And if there's some goods on there, they'll probably get sent home with you. If he tells me he's going to have goods to choice, then we'll sell them and we'll break them, choice, low choice, and goods. There's a place on the contract to do it. But again, it's got to come from you. I sell the man what's represented to me. And again, if it's not represented as it is, then we're going to be in trouble at delivery time. 